Good evening. <laughs> okay, can I get an amen? Okay. Oh, wait, where's Father Perkle? Yes, amen, that's right. Okay, so for those of you I haven't met, I think I see a lot of familiar faces, but I know there's some I haven't met. I'm Deborah Savage. I'm a faculty member at the St. Paul Seminary School of Divinity, where I teach theology and philosophy in both the pre-theology, Masters of Divinity, and lay programs. Uh, that would be three things, so not both, but all three of them. I wear a lot of hats. I'm the, master, I'm the director of the master's degree in pastoral ministry and the program in religious education, so I'm busy. But the other thing that I do is direct the Siena Symposium for Women, Family, and Culture. And as you know, this is our annual Humanitarian Leadership Award event. And tonight we have the great privilege of awarding that award, <laughs> giving that award to Dr. Jennifer Roback Morse, who is obviously sitting here on my right. And in a moment, I'm going to ask Jason Atkins to come up and introduce her and give her the award. Jason is the head of the, uh, the director, is it executive director? President? Chief Czar? How do you of the Minnesota Catholic Conference, and I asked him to do so because they're two, sort of two peas in a pod. So we'll more on that in a minute. But um, let's see, what was I going to say next? So, but before we get any do anything more, I'm going to invite Father Humberto Palomino, who is not only my pastor at St. Mark's. Um, but also the chaplain and spiritual director of the Siena Symposium. So um, you should have a prayer card in your hand. Someone gave it to you when you came in. And um, I'm gonna mention the other members of the board that are here as well in a moment, but I just wanna acknowledge one person in particular, Elizabeth Kelly. Where are you? Right here. Elizabeth Kelly is a professor at the Center for Catholic Studies a spiritual director, don't bother calling her, she's too busy. <laughs> and she wrote this incredible prayer for us, for the, for the uh, intentions of the Siena Symposium. And we will start with that prayer under Father Humberto's guidance. Thank you, Dr. Deborah. She doesn't like to be called Deb, so don't call her Deb. <laughs> De or Debbie, no Debbie or Deb, just Deborah. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, let's pray together. Father Almighty, inspired by the courageous example of your beloved daughter, St. Catherine of Siena, we come before you as women and men who long to make your truth known. We ask for the special grace to listen for your voice and to do all that you ask with prayers. We humbly implore you to bless our industry on behalf of those we serve. Fill us with clarity of mind and heart that we may commit your truth with a bold and faithful eloquence that souls will be saved and you will be glorified. Amen. St. Catherine, that we will sing for and reverence for souls to Jesus. That like you, we may be fearless advocates for the truth of Christ's teaching, especially on respect for the human person and on the special role of women in the church to ally ignorance and combat the evil that attacks human dignity. St. Catherine did all for the glory and praise of God alone. Please pray that we will be given the same We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. St. Catherine of Siena, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much, Father. Um, and thank you, Liz, for that prayer. Um, I just want to say a couple words about the purpose of the Siena Symposium, and then I'm going to turn it over because... Um, my job is done here almost tonight. I get to sit back and listen. Um, but in case it's not clear to you, uh, the Siena Symposium was 
uh, founded really in the late 1990s to respond to John Paul II's call in Evangelium Vitae, paragraph 99, in case you want to look it up. That um, to all women, he said there that uh, it is up to women to articulate an authentic vision of womanhood and establish the culture of life. We have a special role to play, women, in this battle that we all know is under, we're, un we're undergoing. But we want to also say, with in the same breath, really, that it cannot be done without collaboration with the men in our lives. So our mission is to go deeper into this question of what is this complementarity that we all really recognize between men and women, something that characterizes our relationship. What is it that distinguishes us I at the same time recognizing the full human equality we both possess? John Paul II says in the letter to families that our complementarity is what gives us our mission which is to create not only human families, but human history itself. And we, we need to find our way in that. Would you not agree? Yeah. So I mentioned at the dinner earlier that I got a number of questions from people I didn't know asking if men were, if it was okay for men to come. And I was stunned by that because there isn't any way for women to do this by themselves or for men to do that by, by themselves. We have to work together. And that is the mission of the Siena Symposium, is to find a way to understand how that works in such a way that we can free both men and women to contribute their gifts to the, um, fulfillment, the uh, fulfillment of the kingdom. Okay, So that is why we exist. And we named ourselves after St. Catherine of Siena. You might know about her. There's on the back of the prayer card, there's a little information about her and about the symposium. The reason that we picked her is because Catherine, St. Catherine affected the church in the Middle Ages in such an amazing way. It's something you have to study in order to understand it. But I, and I have, and I understand now that the reason she did that the reason she was successful is because the only thing she cared about was souls. She only cared about souls. She wasn't after power. She wasn't after fame or fortune or any of that. She cared about you and your future and your children's future and every person's future. She hoped for every person that they would end up in the arms of our Savior. And that's what we wish too. So I hope that you understand that we're not here because we're feminists. <laughs> I don't even know what that word means anymore. We're here because we love you. And uh, this is our act of service to you, to bring someone like Dr. Morse here to talk to us about how we recover from the mess that we've made of things, right? So we, we want you to know that there's donation cards in case you're interested <laughs> in helping us fulfill that mission. And they're somewhere in the room. I, I know I'm supposed to be better at that part, but I'm not. So, but anyway, that's part of it. But also to mention that we have three events lined up. This is one of, this is the first of our events in 2018. In August, there will be a workshop on Humani Vitae, August 18th. And um, in the October, we're collaborating with the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis, the Office in Marriage and Family to, pull, to bring a conference on that document. It's on October 22nd, the Feast of St. John Paul II, by the way. And um, it's gonna, we're going to try to replicate what we did last December. Is anybody here at the creation conference last December? You shouldn't t tell everybody, but the Siena Symposium was sort of behind that. Keep it quiet, though. <laughs> no, don't keep it quiet. But anyway, so um, just so you know, we have this rhythm of events that we're trying to keep going. And I, want, I hope that I will see you there, OK? So that's all, I, that's all the time I get. 
Okay. So the way this will work is I'm going to introduce Jason, and then he's going to introduce Dr. Morse and give her her surprise, her little present. And then she will talk to us about this topic. And then at, at, th at the end, at a certain time, there'll be time for Q&A, right? There'll be a couple people with microphones that will come around if you have questions. Okay? Okay, you all, you all look so expectant. Okay, so with that, I will bring, ask Dr. or Mr. Adkins, JD, to come up and introduce Dr. Morse. Good evening, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and a delight, and I'm absolutely just thrilled and grateful to Deborah for giving me this opportunity to honor and present an award to one of my you know, strongest professional heroes, Dr. Jennifer Roback Morse. I first became aware of Dr. Morse through her outstanding book, Love and Economics, which was once subtitled, Why the Lies I Fair Family Does Not Work, and is now subtitled, It Takes a Family to Raise a Village which is the title for numerous education seminars put on by Dr. Morse and the Ruth Institute, of which she is founder. Dr. Morse continues to help people understand that while self-interest and the invisible hand of the market may produce positive outcomes in the economic sphere, it is often a disaster for families and children. Families require self-giving on the part of parents and adults, not self-interest. Life for children without strong families and loving parents doesn't just work itself out, but will often turn out to be nasty, brutish, and short. In other words, she's at the forefront of helping people understand the ecosystem in which children, families, and the broader society flourish, which is only natural for a trained economist, as the Greek word oikos, the household, is the root word for both economics and ecology. Dr. Morse's work made her a natural spokesperson for the public defense of marriage in the policy deba debate over whether civil marriage should be redefined into a gender-neutral system of love licenses. She helped promote Proposition 8 in California and was a wonderful asset to our work here in Minnesota, even joining bus tours around the state with our Minnesota for Marriage campaign. She has now turned much of her attention to an equally important topic, telling the stories of the victims and survivors of the sexual revolution. Generation Narcissus, that's the baby boomers for those keeping track and score, proclaimed that it was forbidden to forbid, and embrace the view, in Dr. Morse's words, that adults are entitled to unlimited sexual activity without a live baby resulting. The ensuing moral and cultural deregulation of society liberated the white bourgeoisie to pursue their own pleasures and recreate their identities, but it has left in its wake victims and family fragmentation, divorce, sex trafficking, pornography, abortion, and other ills predicted by Pope Paul VI and Humanae Vitae, about which we will hear more this evening. Ours is not a society where sound social science and logical argument often move hearts and minds. Therefore, Dr. Morse's current project of telling the stories of the victims and survivors of the sexual revolution, whether they were raised by same-sex parents or fell prey to a hookup culture that was supposed to be fulfilling, could be her import most important work yet. Pope Paul VI noted that today, people respond to witnesses more than teachers. Dr. Morse is giving voice to those witnesses despite significant criticism and condemnation and deserves our great thanks. Can I get a witness in the congregation? <laughs> there you go. That's right. <clears throat> Besides Love and Economics, she has authored or co-authored four other books and spoken around the globe on marriage, family, and human sexuality. Her newest books are The Sexual Revolution and Its Victims, and 101 Tips for Marrying the Right Person. She earned her PhD at the University of Rochester and taught economics at Yale and George Mason Universities. Dr. Morse and her husband are parents of an adopted child, a birth child, a goddaughter, and were foster parents in San Diego County to eight foster children. In 2015, Dr. Morse and her husband relocated to Lake Charles, Louisiana, where the work of the Ruth Institute continues. For all these reasons, the Siena Symposium for Women, Family, and Culture rightfully selected Dr. Morse as the 2018 recipient of their annual Humanitarian Leadership Award, and I am greatly honored to be the one to present it to her now. Congratulations, Dr. Morse, and thank you.
and my clicker. All right, everyone. So um, there's no timepiece in here, so I have to turn on my own phone here, so I know so that I don't go on too long. So uh, thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you so much, board members and benefactors of the Siena Symposium. I am really honored to be honored by you all. You know, um, our enemies, our opponents, give us mean prizes. You know, I'm on the Southern Poverty Law Center's ha official hate list, you know. So, so, so I think, <laughs> yeah, y'all need to up your game a little bit, you know, if you're gonna get on that list. But, um, so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, but uh, so we need to give each other good prizes, you know? If the bad guys are giving us bad prizes, we need to be nice to each other. So I really appreciate that very, very much indeed. But especially, I appreciate the opportunity to come up um, to Minnesota and talk with all of you about Humana Vitae and why it was right and what we as Catholics have to offer the rest of the culture. So uh, what I'd like to do is to begin by telling you that I have way too many slides, okay? I have way too much material, which I have done on purpose, and here's what I'm going to do. My friends over here have clipboards that have green sign-up sheets on them, and if you will, and they're gonna circulate them throughout the audience here. If you will give me your email address, I will email these slides to you, and therefore you will have uh, everything I'm gonna say, and you will have the references and the charts and all that, so you don't have to scribble madly, all right? So I will send you that. I'm also recording this, and so it will be up on the Ruth Institute podcast page. You can listen to it, and you can look at the slides at the same time and kind of replicate the experience. That way, I can have almost 70 slides and still get through the whole thing, you know? But some of them I am gonna kind of go over quickly um, and tell you what's important about them, and then you can study it at your leisure. So that's the first thing that we're going to do. So we, um, and, and this is just um, uh, a an, an, uh, promotion for the next event that we're having, uh, which is the Healing Family Breakdown workshop that we're holding in Ann Arbor, Michigan in a few weeks time. So uh, I, I want to just mention, as, a, as Jason mentioned, uh, that I do live in Lake Charles, Louisiana now. You may have heard that we don't have any seasons down there, but that's not really true. We actually do have two seasons in Louisiana. The first season runs from June 1st to the end of November, and that is hurricane season. You may have heard about that. Um, and then the other season that runs from um, the beginning of December through the end of May is crawfish season. And, um, and you're welcome to come visit us anytime you want, your call as to when you want to come. You'll notice that the crawfish up there in the corner, they're very joyful about being eaten. I don't know how they get them to do that, but they are. They're always, they're always looking like that. So, um, but, but also, I just want to remind you, in case you didn't remember this from your North American history class that you may have taken in fourth grade, that uh, this is North America in 1750, so that y'all actually are honorary Cajuns. You just didn't know it up here in Minnesota, okay? But that really is Louisiana before this French and Indian War, you know, which is a long story. I'm not gonna go into the French and Indian War for you. But, um, yeah, that, and in our hearts, you're still part of us, you know what I mean? So, okay, it's a great place to be from. All right, so we're really here, though, to talk about blessed, soon-to-be Saint jo um, uh, Pope Paul VI, and, and just really how prophetic he really was. What can I tell you? <laughs> okay. He's too polite to actually say that to us, but basically, yeah, we, he, I told you so. All right. So around the same time, uh, the Walt Disney Company put together this little uh, propaganda piece is really what it is. And I want to just point it out to you. When you get this, you'll have the link on there, and you can go look this up on YouTube. It was a little video put, to do, put, together, by the, put, put together by Walt Disney Company at the behest of the Population Council, and basically it's a bit of propaganda for why everyone should use birth control, okay? And so it calls itself the plan, family planning story, but of course we know that isn't the whole story. They're not telling us the whole story. And so what we're going to do tonight, the three parts of my talk, we're going to talk about the distinction 
between the technology of birth control and the ideology around it. We're then going to talk about whether it's legally available versus whether it is actively being promoted. And then finally, I'm going to tell you three things you might not have thought of about uh, about Humana Vitae and contraception. And part of the reason I put this together is I was at a wonderful conference at Benedictine College not too long ago, that, and I was the last speaker out of like two full days of great people. And so I thought, oh my gosh, everybody will hear all of this stuff. What am I going to say? What's going to be left to say? So I tried to think of some things that people maybe wouldn't have thought of, and that's why I put it together in this way. So really, you can think of this talk as, what has contraceptive ideology done to America? And think of it that way. Now, <clears throat> the contraceptive ideology is part of the sexual revolution. We have to ask ourselves, what is the sexual revolution? And by the way, did those, are, are those clipboards going around? Okay, and do you have the handheld mic? Can you bring me the handheld mic? Because this is never going to work, me standing here like this. I, I can't bear it. Hello? Is it working? Okay, beautiful. All right, so look at what, it, what is the sexual revolution? The contraceptive ideology is just one part of the sexual revolution, and we at the Ruth Institute, as Jason has said, we have been trying to look at the, the big picture, the whole of the sexual revolution, not just one little corner of it at a time. And I think we are probably the only people who really do it that way. This book that we happen to have over here for sale, uh, we call it The Sexual Revolution and Its Victims. And if you look at the image that we have on the cover, what do we have but Marilyn Monroe? And we feel like Marilyn Monroe is a beautiful image, you might say, or icon of the sexual revolution and its victims, right? Because you can still get a t-shirt with her picture on it. And she's always looking all glamorous and everything. But they never show you her lying there dead with the pill bottle beside her. They never show you that she sexually exploited other people and people sexually exploited her. They never tell you about the 12 abortions that she had. And so all of that bad stuff is airbrushed away. That's how the sexual revolution works. And every time you see somebody with a tote bag with Marilyn Monroe on it, just keep that in mind, that there's a whole lot of the story that is not being shown to you. So now I would like, if you guys wouldn't mind, pass out these brochures that we have. We've got two brochures that I want everybody to have. So in addition to having these slides, you're also going to have these two brochures. One is called, Do You Know a Survivor of the Sexual Revolution? That is a rhetorical question. Everybody knows a survivor of the sexual revolution, right? And once you open it up and see the list, you know, you'll, you'll really see. And then the second one is called, uh, is called uh, Counting the Costs of the Sexual Revolution. And that tries to give some numbers for the number of people who have been harmed by various aspects of the sexual revolution. So those are going around. We're not going to go into that too much now, but you'll be able to look at that at your leisure. And the overall thought process here, our overall strategy is to say, look, yeah, there are a lot of people who, who have done sins. They've done bad stuff. But we don't want to be telling them, you're bad. Because sin extracts its own punishment. Right, particularly in the natural order, uh, in such a way as, this, as, as the body. You know, when you're misusing your body, things happen and they generate consequences. So taking our cue from St. Thomas uh, and doing applied natural law, which is the only kind I can do as an economist, I don't do actual philosophy, but um, sort of rough and ready applied natural law says if you're sinning, bad stuff's going to happen. So why don't we talk about that? Why don't we help people connect the dots between what they did and what has happened to them? And that's what these two brochures are really all about. And that's what our strategy uh, is all about. So we have several programs. I'll just mention them here. We've got educational programs, our newsletter, and our Facebook page. We have some book clubs that we do where we prepare a curriculum and people can read the stuff together in their homes, or you can join us in an online book club. We have the Healing Family Breakdown Workshop, which I've just mentioned. And then coming up, we have our annual dinner uh, and awards dinner where we're going to give good prizes to people, to our friends. Um, and it, we're featuring Why I Don't Call Myself Gay, author Daniel Matson. So those are some of the programs we have to reach out to the survivors of the sexual revolution. So let's talk about the sexual revolution. What do I mean? What do I mean when I say sexual revolution? What am I talking about? It's three interlocking ideas and they have this form. A good and decent society should do these three things. First, a good and decent society should separate sex from babies. 
That is what I call the contraceptive ideology, that a good and decent society should do everything possible to allow people to have sex without having babies. That is our opponent, right? That's the bad idea. Second one, separate both sex and babies from marriage. You probably recognize that idea also. I call that the divorce ideology. And then finally, a good and decent society should wipe out all differences between men and women, except those that are explicitly chosen by individuals. And that I call, along with Pope Francis, I call that the gender ideology. And when Pope Francis talks about the gender ideology, this is pretty much what he's talking about. I think we're on the same page on that subject. Now, I, I just want to let you know that of those three topics, I have these three ideologies, interlocking ideologies, I have three complete 45-minute sessions on each one of those. So if you want to learn more, you can go to the Ruth Institute podcast page and, and look those up and listen in. But uh, this talk is mostly about the contraceptive ideology, uh, and, and I have some new material in here that isn't in those other talks. So let's talk now, uh, let's make a distinction between the technology of birth control and the ideology and the promotion of the ideology. You've probably heard somebody say at some point, you've probably heard people say, the pill changed everything. Yeah, you've heard that, right? You've all heard that. Okay, baloney. The pill is an inanimate object which sits on people's shelves, okay? It's not the pill, it's what we did with the pill. It's the ideology that we created around the pill. So there was such a thing as the first demographic transition that took place in Europe where the fertility rate declined by half. The first demographic transition was discovered in 1929 based on data over the previous 200 years. I would say that was somewhat prior to the pill, wouldn't you say? 1960 is when that was it. Okay, just a tad. All right, so how did they do it? These jolly peasants, what did they do? They used natural methods. That's what they did. They knew how it worked, for crying out loud. They did fertility awareness and a periodic abstinence and extended lactation and, you know, all of that that uh, we're all teaching in special classes now. You know, they somehow managed to control their fertility. What was different was the ideology surrounding how much control you're supposed to have, what context you're supposed to be having sex in, and so on and so forth. That's what was really changing. That's what's really dramatic about the contraceptive ideology. So now I want to talk with you a bit about the question of whether something is legally available versus whether the government is actively promoting it. Now, some of you may have libertarian friends who would say the following sort of thing to you. They would say, it's none of the government's business your views about contraception have no place in the public square because people should be allowed to do whatever they want to do. Has anyone ever heard that? Yeah, oh good, okay, someone has heard this, okay. So uh, what I wanna show is that thing, the contraceptive technology being legally available has never been good enough for the true ideologues. That's what I wanna show you. And I'm gonna show you that by taking you to a place most of you haven't been before, which is the Philippines, all right? Now, in the Philippines, contraception has been legal since 1966. All right, it has been legal since 1966. As of 2011, the Philippines has legalized contraception for the first time. All right, it has been legal since 1966. As of 2011, the contraceptive prevalence rate was 49%, meaning 49% of women of childbearing age were using some form of contraception. However, that was not good enough. The United Nations, several United Nations agencies, many of them funded by the United States government, promoted, actively, heavily promoted this law called the Reproductive Health Law, which was finally passed in 2012. And what that did was to mandate contraceptive counseling. When you get married, you have to sit down and have a nice lady explain to you about the birds and the bees and how you can prevent them from doing whatever, okay? so. What this tells you is that legally available, if, if legally available was the point, you see, they should, have, they should have been out of there. They never should have been in there messing around with legislation in the Philippines, right? They never should have been. But it's a Catholic country, not everybody wanted to use it, so on and so forth. So let's take a look at a few Philippine fertility facts going from 1960 to 2010. I love this kind of stuff, you guys, numbers, graphs, charts, 
live with it, okay? I know you're not all into it, but love, you know, I love this stuff. So, 1960, total population, 24 million. 2010, total population, 94 million. Oh my gosh, they're out of control. They're breeding like rabbits. Look at the next line. Total fertility rate, 1960, 7.15 births per woman. 2010, 3.15 births per woman. Huh, look at that. How'd they get all those people if the fertility rate fell? Well, look at those next two lines. Look at those next two lines. The infant mortality level dropped. The maternal mortality dropped. The lifespan extended by 10 years. That w this is a success story. This is an astonishing success story of development and growth. And, and of course, besides, I don't know how many Filipinos you've ever met in your life, but as far as I'm concerned, more Filipinos is a good thing. These are great people. They're, I mean, they're, they're great people. Anyway, so it's not that people were breeding like bunnies. It's that they were no longer dropping like flies. That's what is generating, that's what's generating the population growth. And this is supposed to be a problem. We're all supposed to be upset. Give me a break, okay? So this is not about people's freedom or their choices. This is about the ideology that we've got too many of those people breeding. So these, here's the statistics. You can go look it up if you want to look, look for it. And I want to show you this one last graph here. This is from the USAID. That's the United States uh, Aid to International Development. This is our... Um, our foreign aid, okay, the United States spending on foreign aid in 2013, the year after the reproductive health bill passed. I want you to look at that top thing. How much do we contribute, the very top line, for family planning and reproductive health? $20 million we contributed, contributed, gave to the Philippines. Look at the last line. Water supply and sanitation, $1.3 million. Huh. If you're a Filipino person, do you think you'd rather have clean water or a box of condoms? I mean, please. <laughs> you know, I mean, th th this is our government. Look at this. Pandemic influenza and other in nutrition. Look at, look at the big amount we spent on nutrition help. Zero. You know, come on. This is not freedom. Okay, I don't know what it is, but this is not about letting people do what they want, uh, letting, having it be legal and letting people do whatever they choose to do. So now let's talk just briefly about the United States and the campaign that led up to the Griswold decision. Some of you may know the Griswold decision is the Supreme Court decision that came down in 1965, which removed all um, restrictions from any state it removed the, the ability of any state to regulate birth control of any kind, okay? And that was the open door to the whole matter of there being no regulation, right? So on one side, um, and it took like 30 years to get this done. They went to the state legislature 30, year after year after year, and they lost every year. They lost, 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 lost. And it was only when they took it to the courts that they won, see? And on one side, you had people from the Yale Law School and the Yale Medical School staging the case that would allow the, the court case to go forward. And on the other side, you had the Catholic Church defending the poor immigrants whom everybody knew were the target of this thing. Everybody understood it was those poor people having too much too many babies. How do we know that? Because contraception was, in fact, widely available in, in, in Connecticut at this time. You could walk into a drugstore and buy a box of condoms, even though technically it was illegal. Women could go to their doctors and get uh, a prescription for a diaphragm fitting. All right. So when you ask them, why, do you, why are we going to so much trouble to get rid of a law that nobody's enforcing? What's the point of that? There were two points. One point was they want it to be available for poor people who can't go to the doctors. Well, you know, the Catholic Church had something to say about that, like, well, why don't we make it so people can go to the doctor? You know, for example, you know, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, duh, exactly, exactly. So what they really wanted was the freestanding birth control clinic, which was not, which would not have been legal, that you wouldn't have gotten away with a freestanding birth control clinic. What goes on inside the doctor's office, nobody was regulating that. You know, they could have done that, but that wasn't enough. We gotta have the freestanding birth control clinic. But more importantly, we gotta have the ability to promote it. And this was pointed out by this uh, author, this is a Humanist of the Year author, 
saying basically the presence of these laws made it impossible for the state to encourage contraception, something it now increasingly deems necessary to do. The middle income and the affluent married and unmarried use contraceptives. The poor have babies. When the poor, often racial minorities, are on welfare rolls, taxpaying Americans rebel and expect the state to do something about it. This is a guy who thought it was all grand. This is not somebody trying to embarrass them. I mean, this is what, this is what they really thought, okay? So they wanted to be promoting it. That's all, right? <sighs> and by the way, since this is a Catholic crowd, I'm gonna say this. You see this business? When the poor are on welfare rolls, taxpaying Americans rebel and expect the state to do something about it. This is a characteristic of the welfare state. There's a Lutheran scholar called Alan Carlson who's written extensively about the welfare state, and he points this out, that whenever you have a welfare state, people all of a sudden discover that there's a fertility problem. Where all of a sudden, the government is worried about how many babies people are having. I would just like to point out, as Catholics, we have been taking care of poor people going all the way back to St. Stephen. Yes? Have we ever told people you're having too many babies because we're taking care of you, so stop having babies? No. Where do they come up with this? Well, it has to do with the welfare state and its whole mentality and its whole way of working and thinking and so on and so forth. Anyway, I had to throw that in. It's not on the slide. It's good that you're here. Heard it in person. What happened? What happened? Okay. Yeah, so the government was already actively pursuing contraception in their foreign policy and to some extent in some of their domestic policies. This was already in the works. So for your libertarian friends pester you about this question, um, are, are you really okay? You really want to take away our pills, don't you? You know, they're like, no, we would be happy if we just, if it was legal, but nobody promoted it. And how long, my friend, do you think it was? How long was the period of time between the time it was legal and the time it was actively promoted? The answer is about five minutes. Okay, it took no time at all for him to start pumping this. And if we went through all the programs that actively promote contraception, we would be here all day. Okay, there's another reference. Now, I want to tell you about three things about contraception and the contraceptive ideology that you might not have thought of before. First of all, what has been the impact of contraception and the contraceptive ideology among the educated elites of our culture? The fact is, the whole upper end of the economy is built upon delayed childbearing. I'm at a university, you all know this is true, right? If you're gonna make it into the professions, you have to postpone childbearing. And I see some disgruntled looking women nodding their heads, right? We all know this is true. So I want you to look, the the illustration that we have here, on the Supreme Court right now, we have three women. Two of them have never been married and have no children. Sonia Sotomayor, Elena Kagan, they don't know squat about the needs and interests and desires of the average mother. Miss uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she is married, had children, but she did it early on at a time when people could get married have kids and have a career and still, and still have their kids before menopause sometime. You know, because, because her husband stayed married to her for a lifetime. And that's not as common anymore. So she got the benefit of all of that and didn't really realize what the benefit of it really was. So what that means, folks, is that the decision makers in our culture, the people who occupy the higher echelons of the professions, are selectively more likely to be people who have postponed childbearing, people who are more likely to be in favor of contraception and abortion, because that's kind of how they got it done. They weren't all living chaste lives till they were 34, 35, whatever the average age at first marriage is for that demographic anymore, okay? So, in, and it's a kind of a self-perpetuating uh, situation where all of our media is coming from people who have uh, gone down that path. And I put this illustration up here. Some of you may have seen this conversation between Dr. Jordan Peterson and Kathy Newman, this uh, BBC announcer. And eight, eight, eight million people have seen this video by now. But if you go back and look at that video with this thought in mind, you will see this woman is utterly clueless, right? She's utterly clueless about how privileged she really is and how different she is from the typical woman. She has no idea, no idea at all. Yet, she 
is the one with the job at the BBC, not somebody like those of us who have multiple children, right? We're not going to get to that point. I mean, a few people are, but on the whole, that's not how it's going to go. So this is a self-perpetuating issue. Now, among the less educated, the combination of the contraceptive ideology and, act, and the welfare incentives that have been built in to the welfare system, marriage has pretty much disappeared among the lower classes. Whether, and, and if you look at that, sometimes people will look at it as a race thing, but if you look past race and just look at education, just, just track the people who haven't graduated from high school and then look at people who have graduated with graduated from high school and those who have some college and those who have There's a huge marriage gap. The lower down you go in the educational ladder, the, more, the less, like, the less like you, like you are to have a stable, intact family. So the contraceptive ideology has created this gap between, it's created a whole new layer of inequality, you could say, right? Um, and we have the whole phenomenon of multiple partner fertility, which is a part of the divorce ideology too, and so on and so forth. So that's this, this gap that has been created, the contraceptive ideology is gravely culpable in that thing. And so here's the first thing you may not have thought of, and that is that the contraceptive ideology has distorted the whole economy. The whole economy is built around contraception and abortion. So just chew on that thought. I won't go into all the other reasons why I think that. In, in, in addition to what we've said here, if you think about it, you'll see that, that I think you'll see that's the case. Here's the second thing. The contraceptive ideology preaches the separation of sex from babies. And that means that every person who's old enough to give meaningful consent is entitled to unlimited sexual activity. That, that, that's our world, right? That's the world we live in. And that means that all your contraception has to be free, abortion has to be free, otherwise it's interfering with your right to choose, blah, blah, blah. We're familiar with these arguments. Well, free doesn't just mean no out-of-pocket expenses. It means no downside risks. It means nothing that would impede you from using either contraception or accessing abortion. And so therefore, part of the contraceptive ideology includes, as part of the package deal, that you must minimize or downplay all of the risks that are associated with the use of contraception, all of the risks associated with abortion. You all are a fairly well-educated pro-life crowd, so you're familiar with some of this stuff. I don't need to go through in detail what all these risks are. Most of you are familiar with it. But what I do want to point out is uh, how the media reports on this. That's a point I want to make here. And I've got one example here, something that took place about five years ago. This study came out, very good study, very solid study, Danish study of, of 1.3 million women looking at their uh, at things that happened, looking at their contraceptive history and their various risks. So what they found is that the risk of stroke of the most commonly used form of contraception was comparable to the risk of smoking. So that's pretty serious, right? Um, and the, the risk associated with the patch and the ring, which are the long-acting reversible contraceptives, though the risks are even greater for that. Those of you who've done pro-life work, I'm sure are familiar with that because you've talked with girls who've come in with these rods in their arms or you know these, these patches that they can't get rid of and so on and so forth. So, you know, we kind of know this, right? You guys aren't shocked that I'm telling you that the contraception, that hormonal contraception is implicated in creating strokes. Uh, but here's how the news media covered this story. WebMD, heart, stroke risk, low with birth control pills. Boston Globe, birth control pills raise risk of heart attacks and strokes, but only slightly. I mean, I didn't make these headlines up, right? I mean, this is, what, this is how they reported it. And here's what the, some formulations of oral contraceptives which contain a mix of, mix of estrogen but can double a woman's risk of having a heart attack or stroke. But in absolute terms, the risk is very low because young women under age 50 rarely have heart attacks. I feel so much better. Thank you for explaining that to us. Okay, well, explain that to this family, this young girl. Erica Langhart died at the age of 24 from a stroke at 24. When she went in with these symptoms, the doctor said to her, are you on the pill? And her mother's like, what do you mean? What, what do you, 
In other words, it was no, well known enough to the doctor that that was the first word out of his mouth, right? So anyway, she died. Her parents uh, tried to sue the drug manufacturers. And this is very telling. They and a bunch of people tried to sue the drug manufacturers. They were offered a settlement which had as part of the settlement that they would shut up, and they refused to take the settlement. They thought it was a pittance. They thought it was ridiculous. They didn't take it. Eventually, the mother committed suicide. Okay, it's a tragic story, and you never, you never hear, even you guys probably didn't hear this particular story. So the, the, this, is the, um, the, the, this is the thing that I want to tell you about it. I want you to start paying attention to how this is reported or not reported. Risks associated with abortion, some of you are familiar with this material. I'm just flash, flashing it up there. Some of my references, uh, I would suggest this film called Hush, the Hush film, very, very good film. Um, that details a lot of this stuff, and it's a good thing for like a movie night or something here on campus, something like that. Um, so the second thing that you might not have thought of is that the contraceptive ideology has corrupted the professions. And what I mean by that is in the stories I just told you, law, medicine, journalism, they're distorting the truth to circle the wagons around the contraceptive ideology. They should, the ones who should be telling the story are not telling the story the way it should. They should be. All right, so on to the third one. The Ruth Institute dream. This is the sort of thing Jason was talking about. Our dream is that every child be welcomed into a loving home with a married mother and father. That's our dream. And the question is, do, what do we owe to children? What do we owe to children? Do we owe children more than just survival? I mean, this is the minimal care Romanian orphanage, you know, Nobody's violating their rights. Give me a break, right? So what is owed to the child? Well, we say that a child is, every person has the right to know their cultural heritage and their genetic identity. You're entitled to know who you are. Secondly, you're entitled to relationship. Every child has the right to a relationship with their natural mother and father, except for an unavoidable tragedy. This is material we developed over the course of our debating gay marriage, right? Because uh, Gay marriage threatens this, threatens these entitlements. And so we decided to, let's expand this thought. Let's really work on this thought so that it's not just about gay, gay parents, it's about everybody. Everybody's entitled to these things. So how can we secure these rights to the child? Well, we need to make a plan for parents to cooperate with each other for a lifetime. Because that gives the best chance for kids to be in relationship with both parents. Because the parents aren't cooperating with each other. If they hate each other's guts, they live on opposite sides of the country. Mm, relationship is not going to be so good, right? That's going to compromise it. So to put it negatively, now you know, as, you, we have kind of an older crowd here. Y'all remember pre-Vatican II, when the church's position, we always knew what the church stood for. The church's answer was always, no! We don't know what the question is, but the answer is no! <laughs> right? <laughs> right? I see I don't have to explain that, right? You know what I'm talking about. So John Paul was trying to put a stop to that, because he wanted us to see what was the positive good. What, what's the good that all those prohibitions are pointing toward? So, but I'm gonna go negative on you for a few minutes. No sex outside of marriage. Contraception doesn't bail you out. Abortion doesn't bail you out. No divorce without cause. No petty criticism of your spouse. The feminists did a lot of damage in this one. They gave us unlimited permission slips to nag our about being unequal, this or that or the third thing, right? I don't know about y'all, but I didn't really need any coaching on that particular point. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, right? Okay, so this part of our culture, no petty criticism of your spouse, certainly no third party reproduction. Don't go, go, go off to a sperm bank where your child's never gonna know each other. So that lifelong cooperation plan, put it positively, get married before having sex. Only have sex with your spouse. Stay married unless somebody does something really awful. Be nice to your spouse. In other words, ta-da, traditional Christian sexual morality. That's it, that's how we protect the rights of children. Now I get that there's a whole set of theology and philosophy and all that stuff layered on top of this. I get that, or behind it, or under it, or all wrapped around it. But I'm, you know, I'm a knuckle-dragging materialist economist. What can I tell you? This is the practical implication of the thing. The practical benefit of traditional Christian morality is that we're protecting the rights of children to their parents and to their identity. That's what we're doing. 
And that's a good thing, and that's gone completely away. So if we begin with the idea of children's rights, and we start from that child's perspective, and we do a little bit of logical reasoning, that's what we end up with, is traditional Christian sexual ethics. In other words, the church has been right all along. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now, these charts in red, this is the stuff for you to take home and look at. These are a series of charts on contraceptive failure rates, and I'm not gonna go through them in detail. I'm just gonna tell you, when you take them home and ponder them, and I know you all will because you love this data just as much as I do, I'm sure. Okay, what you'll find when you look at it is that all contraception fails. And when you look at the next chart that has tons of detail on it, breaks it down, contraceptive failure rates by age, marital status, and poverty rate level, what you find is that contraception, the, and here's what these numbers mean. Let me go back to the, the simpler chart here. What these numbers mean is if you have 100 women and they're all using the pill, at the end of 12 months, 8.1 of them will have a pregnancy. Okay, that's what, that's what these numbers mean. So it's an actual use. This is actual survey data, okay? So the overall um, failure rate of the pill is about 8%, according to these data. But when you go to this chart and you look at breaking it down by your age, your marital status, and how poor you are, what you find out is that there's a huge variation. If you look at the people who are married versus the people who are cohabiting, at any age, the girls who are cohabiting are much more likely to have a, con a pregnancy, whether you want to call it a contraceptive failure or whatever you want to call it. They're just, as a matter of fact, more likely to end up with a pregnancy. So, and, and likewise with poverty. Now, I'm not going to go through all this. I'm just going to, because your eyes are glazing over, I can see it all. So let me just tell you what those charts show you is that contraception is least likely to work for the poor, for the young, and for the unmarried. To whom, we, to whom do we market contraception most heavily? The young, the poor, and the unmarried. These charts were not produced by the Bishop's Conference. These charts were produced by the research arm of Planned Parenthood, the Allen Guttmacher Institute. They know perfectly well what they're doing. They know perfectly well that contraception does not work for everybody, okay? So let's talk a little bit more, and, yeah, and I've, you see all those brilliant references, you can go look them all up yourself if you don't believe me, or if one of your friends challenges you or something. Okay, so, so, so let's say, what happens if your contraception fails? What happens? You've got some options. First option, get married, raise the child together. That used to be called the shotgun wedding, okay? Now, nobody knows what a shotgun wedding is. If you go, I tried this, Google, go to Google Images, and type in shotgun wedding images. And what you'll find is a picture of a bride holding a gun. Okay? <laughs> no idea. They have no idea what this is all about. And by, and by the way, that's not a great option. Right? That's not a great option. In fact, back in the day, the church was often reluctant to marry a couple if that was the only reason they were getting married because this is a lifelong commitment, y'all. You know, what are you doing? Okay, second, second possibility is that both parents relinquish their parental rights and place the child for adoption. Back in the day, this was considered the best option for the child because the child gets to have parents. But if you think that you have, you, the child is owed a relationship with their natural parents, is owed to know who they are, there is an injustice here, right? An injustice that could have been prevented if you didn't have to put the child up for adoption, right? So that's kind of unjust. Then the other option is that one, child, one parent raises the child alone with limited and uncertain contact with the other parent. Well, if the child really has a right to know both parents, that's kind of unjust also, right? Because you never know what, the, what, what is that relationship ever going to look like. And then, of course, the final option, the one that we're all being steered toward, is you just kill the baby. These options are unjust. This is un the options you have after you've gotten yourself into this situation, right, where you have a, a pregnancy, all of the choices are unjust. And so this is the third thing you might not have thought of. The contraceptive ideology is unjust to children. It is unjust to children. So we're dealing with competing worldviews. Every child, one world, one worldview here, 
is that, and this is the view that, of the Ruth Institute, is that every child, and hence every adult, has identity rights and relational rights with respect to their parents. And, psst, 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 shh, adults have obligations to provide these things for children. We don't like to say that very loud because nobody wants to think about having obligations. The competing worldview, the worldview of Planned Parenthood and the United Nations and all these other people, the competing worldview is adults are entitled to do whatever they want sexually with a minimum of inconvenience and psst, kids just have to suck it up. The kids just have to accept whatever the adults choose to give them. We don't say that out loud because it would be so obvious. We'd be ashamed of ourselves if we said that. But that's pretty much the view of our government now and, and the government of all of the so-called civilized nations. So the sexual revolution, in sum, it's irrational. It's impossible. You cannot build a whole society around the idea that sex doesn't make babies. It can't be done. You can reduce the probability of any particular sexual act making a baby. Okay, contraception can do that. But you can't build a whole society around the idea that sex and babies are separate. That's what we're trying to do. Same with the other two points of the sexual revolution, which I won't go into. They're also irrational and impossible. So it can't stand on its own. It cannot naturally reproduce and support itself. If you're going to build a society around the idea that children come from sex and that children have rights and stuff like that, you, you can do that. Nature will reinforce your view that sex makes babies. You know, on a fairly regular basis, that view will be confirmed, right? So therefore, the sexual revolution requires force, and it requires propaganda, a lot of propaganda, to keep it going, to keep the idea alive, to keep the dream alive, you know? And so that is why, that, that right there, is the key to understanding how this thing has become a totalitarian ideology that no Christian should have anything to do with. It is a totalitarian ideology. It can't be done. The fact that it can't be done does not mean that it's harmless. See, the fact that people are trying to do something impossible doesn't mean it's all gonna collapse on, under its own weight. That, that's not necessarily true, see. So I call it a fantasy ideology, and it's beyond left and right. I think it's a mistake to think of it as strictly a left-wing ideology. Those guys doing the population control stuff, those weren't left-wing people. Those were right-wing people doing that. And it's similar in these ways. Um, the sexual revolution grants ever-increasing power to a subset of people in society, and I think you can see how that's happening to us now. Um, it's impervious to evidence that conflicts with the fantasy, and it's very intolerant of dissent. All right, we got to do something about those little sisters of the poor refusing to give contraception to their employees. I mean, we just cannot tolerate that amount of dissent. So the sexual revolution and its victims, there's an essay in there, in that book. Um, if we only had enough condoms, we could solve everything, you see. This is part of the fantasy ideology. Poverty, global warming, deforestation, inequality, all these things. If only we had enough condoms, that would all be great. I call that condomism. <laughs> It hasn't caught on as a term, you know, but. <laughs> you know, we have to laugh at this stuff, otherwise we'd all be hiding under the bench and never do anything, you know? So we have to have, to have a little fun oh, while we're at it. So recently, just to show you that this is current, just a couple of weeks ago, I heard from a young friend at a major university, a major state university, which shall go unnamed, um, that, and it, it was a talk given in the International Affairs Department. Somebody stood up there and said, you know, the solution to deforestation, poverty, global warming, all this stuff, all we need is contraception. And the students, there were some African students in the audience, and they were just appalled. But they didn't know what to say. They didn't know how to say it and so on. Um, and it turned out that this guy, this organization, was, from, uh, was financed by Bill and Melinda Gates. It was a so, uh, private organization, but they received... Eight million dollars from Bill and Melinda. Do you get eight million dollars from Bill and Melinda, Deborah? No, I don't either. I don't either. Y'all need to fill out those donation cards, baby, because this is what we're dealing with. This is what we're up against. Okay, so th I want to close with this set of ideas. That th there's a resentment of facts. There's a resentment of reality. The contraceptive ideology resents the fact that sex makes babies. They're, they're mad about it. 
The divorce ideology resents the fact that children need their own parents and not just a pair of hands, right? And the gender ideology resents the fact that men and women are different. In other words, they are in open conflict with human embodiment. Every point of the sexual revolution is in open conflict with the fact that we have bodies and that the bodies have some limitations. And so that is, to my mind, a modern form of Gnosticism, with the major uh, points being a resenting of the limitations of the human body and also that there's secret knowledge available only to the elites of society who are going to somehow make it all work out and you knuckleheads who still think sex makes babies, well, too bad for you. We're going to somehow manage this all. Um, and the end game, sometimes people ask me this, what are they up to? Where will it end? Dr. Morse, when is this going to end? The gender ideology, I can tell you where those people are going. I can t I, I, don't flip out, but this is where they're going. They want to remove all references of male and female out of the law and out of society. That's where they're headed. And if we don't stop them, that's where they're going. Okay? The, the divorce ideology, their end game is contract parenting, by which they mean to completely separate biology from the legal definition of parenthood. You could see this very clearly with gay marriage. This is why they invested so much in gay marriage. Not because they cared that much about people having their wedding dresses and whatnot and the health benefits and all that. That was all already handled. This was what they were after, was a legal regime that would somehow legitimate separating biology from legal parenthood. That's why they put so much into it. And then finally, the contraceptive ideology, the end game of the contraceptive ideology is population control. That's where these, that's where these guys are headed. And again, it's an open conflict with human embodiment. What are some of their motivations? Population control, making money. Some people are making a lot of money on this stuff having sex with only the consequences they want, and finally, of course, acquiring power. Now, I put this image of this book up here, Subverted, by my friend Sue Ellen Browder. You may have heard about this book. Um, she, uh, she's also a survivor of the sexual revolution, you know, somebody who went through it and lived to tell it. And what she tells is she wrote for Cosmo, Cosmopolitan magazine, and she recounts in this book how they basically invented the Cosmo girl character as somebody to market to. The single, unattached career woman was somebody they could sell stuff to. The nice stay-at-home mom who was fixing her own meals and whose husband would come home to her every day, no matter how she looked, she was not in the market for expensive perfume, cosmetics, and trips, and takeout food, you know? So they invented the Cosmo Girl, and Sue Ellen reports that. So that's why I put that book up there for you, just so you know I'm not making this up. I mean, I think most of you can kind of see some elements of it, but she was there uh, on this occasion. So the alpha males, some of the big people in our society, they like the sexual revolution. They like it just the way it is. They're putting a lot of money into it. Warren Buffett has given over a billion dollars to abortion-related causes. So whether you're thinking about Warren Buffett, you're thinking about George Soros, Bill Gates, that guy up there on the left, that is, um, that's the guy who put a lot of money into the gay marriage fights. What's that guy's name? What's that? Paul Singer. Yes, he's the guy who bought gay marriage in New York State. He put the money on the table to make that possible. Anyway, they like it. That's the point. And the only thing we have is our numbers and the truth. And that's why we all need to be on the playing field in whatever capacity we have, whatever amount of money you have that you can donate to, to Deborah or to me or to whoever else is doing this work because there are a lot of good people doing good work. We need to all be on the playing field because that's all we got is our numbers and the truth. So those are some things you can be involved with. Sign up to get the slides, and I'll be glad to take questions now. Thank you very much, everybody. So what's the game plan now? First of all, did everybody get a chance to sign the clipboard who wanted to? Did It didn't make it over here? The clipboard didn't make it over this away. I'm oh, seeing. Okay. So okay. if somebody who Thank has you. a clipboard would pass it over there. And then did everyone receive each of the two pamphlets? Did everybody receive those? Okay. All right. Very well. 
So right. now we have some time left for questions, and I will come with the microphone. Okay, I'm coming over there. Hey. Okay, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> How does that work? How do they, what do they get out of it? Okay, so, so for some of them, the population control idea is very compelling. And I think, I think we mustn't underestimate the power of the fantasy, right? They have the idea that they're creating a better world by controlling everybody's fertility. So that's a part of it, for sure that's part of it. The fantasy ideology itself is its own reward. But I also think that, um, that they, they have the, and this idea, I don't think they can express this idea. Soros, I think, is a particularly compelling um, example that he has a vision of the world being sort of under control. And fertility and the family is something that if it's allowed to go by itself, it, it will never, you, you, you can't control things when mom and dad have created their own little society, right? You can't control that. And, and that, that's the way that the family is the, is the vanguard against all different kinds of totalitarian systems. They've always been after that. So whatever, your other, whatever other motive you might have, uh, doing something uh, about delinking family members from each other, it makes individuals more vulnerable. The individual is by themselves dealing with whatever it is that's coming down at them. So if you look at the Chinese case, that's the most dramatic, where they had that one child policy for all those years, which they're now trying to get out of because they've figured out that it's not a good thing, which you could have figured out 40 years ago, but do the math, whatever. Anyway, um, if everybody has one child, that means in that next generation, nobody has any cousins. Nobody has any siblings. Right? All you have is you, your mommy and daddy, and your grandparents, and then you have the government. And that's it. You, know, you don't have any system of, of competing loyalties. So that, all of that, I think, factors into it. I, and also, don't underestimate the power of the desire to have sex on your own terms. Right? So they're creating a world, the alpha males, if you think about it, the alpha males, they're creating a world where they get to have sex without any responsibility being imposed on them by the wider society. They get to leave the woman if they want to. They get to change out, the, you know, change out the partners, have serial polygamy, more or less, right? They get to kill the baby if the baby's in the way. You know, they, they get to do all that. Well, the average Joe, you know, the betas, the gammas, the people in his room, right? It doesn't work out as easily for us, right? When these things fall apart, right? Uh, and and so. I, I don't know that they're trying to be mean necessarily to poor people, but it doesn't bother them. You know, the fact that poor kids don't have their dads, that just, that, that doesn't, it just doesn't enter into their calculation. That doesn't bother them. I, I, that, that's the best I can do for explaining why they do it. But you have to admit, they've invested a lot in this stuff. I'd like to add something to that just y really yes. quick. And then I'm coming around while I talk with the oh, microphone. Right. <laughs> I'm the theologian in the crowd. And I would point out that our la the last message from Our Lady of Fatima was that the battle would be the family. So let's not underestimate what's going on here. The evil one, I'm just going to say it out loud, is very, very smart. And he's getting us right where we live. John Paul II says in Love and Responsibility that uh, the sexual act is participation in the transmission of existence. And it's like when you don't approach the sexual act with the right attitude or formation, it's like trying to get a hold of an electrical current. You start to, it, there's a short. So the devil has entered into our lives right where we live and breathe. So I didn't, don't know who is, do you think we'll try again? Okay, um, I guess right here and then that gentleman back there. My question is, you said a lot about how if we would just take away the propaganda, if we just wouldn't advertise it, that would solve a lot of our issues. Do you think that we've come far enough that that won't matter anymore? We've advertised it enough that everybody knows it's out there, it's an option. 
if you want to have sex and not have kids, they'll still search it out at this point since it's already been advertised. Yes, and it's not just, yes, I think you're correct in this, in, and I would add to what you just said, that, um, that part of what's been advertised is not simply the availability of contraception, but also the ethos that this is what sex is all about. What sex is all about is the immediate pleasure and whether you've consented or not. That's, that's what it's all about. And so as long as you still think that, you're right, people are gonna go looking for it, right? So if, if you continue to advertise uh, one part of it without the other, that's not, gonna be, that's not really gonna be good enough. It's the whole of the ideology that has to be addressed. It's not just, hey, everybody can get their free pills over here. It's also this whole um, cultural complex of things that uses the sexual, sexual allure for advertising, that sexually stimulates people every time you turn around, um, you know, and that basically promotes a certain view of the human body, as, as Deborah just said, a certain view of the human body, a certain view of the human person, and human sexuality itself and, and what its proper place is in our lives. So that's what has to be addressed. And when I say the contraceptive ideology, that's a kind of a shorthand for that whole complex of issues. Um, so uh, you've covered a little bit already about in that first question about different motives driving. You talked about the fantasy uh, and the idea of power and population control. Um, so I'm sure there's a lot of different motives sort of driving this as well as maybe even some spiritual uh, forces at play. But um, so back in the 60s when they started pushing for the, uh, you know, the marketing of this, to what degree was just profits of drug companies a motive driving this? Uh, and uh, and a kind of a follow-up question, you know, with all of this, are there any things that we as common folk can do, you know, for our part to try and find a solution? Oh, okay, so th the first part of your question there, uh, I, I couldn't honestly say specifically back in the day how much money people were making on it or, or, and how that was influencing people. I can tell you this, that some of the people who financed some of the early court cases uh, Hugh Hefner was one of them, so that's a guy who's making money off of it. Uh, the guy who made contraceptive foam, he financed some of those cases, okay? The, the financial bonanza of the birth control pill, I don't know how obvious, th I don't know how long it took for people to figure that out, but now, for sure, that's a huge motive, right? right. And, and the way they treated the Langhart family really shows that, you know, that it's to them, and this is what Mrs. Langhart said that I think was so demoralizing to her, making these settlements to the family, that was just the cost of doing business for them. That was no big, that was, it was slap on the wrist. Cost in their calculation, it was like, you know, okay, yeah, we'll settle, you know, this poor girl died, who cares, we've got money to make, you know. Um, so uh, at this point, I don't think there's any doubt that it's huge, point one, point two, this is another thing coming down the pike with the whole transgender, gender identity issue. Because if a person decides that they want to be the, uh, the opposite sex, they're going to be on very powerful drugs for their whole life. And somebody's going to make money on those drugs, right? There was an article in The Federalist not too long ago where somebody had gone through and really researched that and really showed that there was a lot of connection between the people who were going to make money on the drugs and financing academic centers that promote transgender ideology and so on and so forth. So there's a lot to what you say. Now, what can ordinary folk do? Uh, first of all, you've got to inform yourself so that you're not freaked out when this stuff comes up because the enemy is very clever about coming up with catchy slogans and every one of those catchy slogans has to be dissected. So you need to you, know, you need to inform yourself, right? And you may not be able to inform yourself on every point, but you need to pick out some things and you know get yourself educated. That's honestly why we developed the book club program, because it's, it's like four weeks worth of material that somebody can sit down and read in a group, and it's not overwhelming. You know, because I, I think people do feel overwhelmed, you know, when you look at the vast material that's out there. So that's why we developed that. Um, and then you just latch yourself to whatever your issue is going to be and get out there and be a resource for people and stuff like that. That's what I would recommend. Because you don't want to be overwhelmed. I mean, we, we, tr we try to give this um, big picture view of it because I think it's helpful. But I can tell you from experience, it'll make you crazy. You know, if you're trying to be at the legislature on every single one of these issues, you can't do it, right? You have to specialize uh, on some level. But um, so that's what I would say. Pick your thing and go for it and don't let it go. 
Who's got the other um, mic? Oh, here we go. Yeah. <coughs> uh, I was wa- I've always wondered this from an economic standpoint, but I was wondering if you do you see any connection with the sex revolution and the collapse of the auto industry and the housing bubble? Because it seems like these two products are kind of lifelong products, and it seems like that this they're a direct result from this sexual revolution. You so know, I, was about I, that. I don't I don't know. I don't I don't have a good answer to that um, because. Uh, it, it's it's just more complex than that. The, the 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 one place where I think there is a connection is that uh, as two earner households have become more common, the high end of the of the housing market has gotten bigger and bigger and more and more expensive. So that if you're in a big urban metropolitan area like this, where there are a lot of two earner couples, the housing costs are really unapproachable for a single for a a family with one earner in it, right? Because they've bid up the housing prices. And and so, you know, in a sense, it's distorted the housing market that way. You, that's much less true in smaller towns where there aren't the opportunities for professional couples to go there and have two big salaries, you know? So in Lake Charles, it's not the same kind of thing that you would have over here. Um, so, so that's one way that it's happened. But there are a lot of other different ways that the sexual revolutions affected the economy. Housing bubble, mm, I don't know about that. I, I don't know about that so much. I mean, I think that's a, that's a little bit different thing. Okay, I just want to point out it's 10 to 9, so we're aware of that. Sorry. What? It's 10 to 9, so I just want to let you know that I know that, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> and um, so we have time maybe for two more quick questions. Would that be Okay. And I already, I'm sorry to say I already have those people identified because the names, the hands went up. But I, I think people need to leave by nine probably, right? Or we can stay longer if you want to, but just in case there's some people that want to leave. Um, so I just kind of have a quick question. You know, you were talking about um, propaganda and advertising and marketing and um, there's not like a positive uh, opposition you know, um, for one thing, there were issues in the past with things like the Magdalene laundries, but then you see like these after school special shows where if you go to um, a place for women to get help who are pregnant, that like you're gonna get beat over the head by the Bible and, and that sort of thing, or it's like some kind of weird Rosemary's baby situation. So it seems to me that there needs to be more positive information that there is help. And right. that's all I really want to right. say. Well, I agree with what you're saying. You know, the particular thing that you mentioned there, though, of the of the demonizing of the crisis pregnancy centers, that's all part of the propaganda process, right? Because what the crisis pregnancy center says to a woman is, you can do this. You can be a good mom, and we're going to help you. You can do this, right? So she's, and, and they try to educate her about the next situation, which often is the most challenging thing, because a lot of those women are back then, with multiple mul- multiple partner fertility, um, multiple non-marital childbearing, you know. So that's what they're trying to deal with. But even that is too much. You need to see that for the true revolutionaries who are dominating the media, that's too much. They can't handle that. They cannot handle that amount of opposition. So um, I feel like the uh, the whole pregnancy care center movement is extremely positive, very important thing, and you can tell it's important by the way they're attacking it, right? So uh, I, I don't think it means we're doing something wrong that they're attacking us. I mean, that's just what we're go- they're going to do whenever we do it right. But I do agree that we, we, need, we just need to be out there more. You know, there, there are a lot of us. We need to be out there uh, because if we do nothing, this is what they're going to do. You know, they're going to remove all reference to male and female out of the law and out of social practice Forever, that's where they're going, and somebody's got to stop them. So there are multiple places you can be involved, not just with us. There are a lot of moms who are involved in sex ed, trying to stop sex ed, sex ed in the schools. Okay, listen to me. Sex ed is propaganda. It is propaganda for the sexual revolution. All of it. I don't care what's in it. There's no point arguing about what should be and shouldn't be in it. It should all go away. That needs to be the uh, the the end game you know, that we have in mind. And the, the you know I'm I'm aware of a bunch of moms who are trying to do that, trying to make that happen. So there are many many fronts in this war, and I'm never going to tell people you're not doing enough unless you're not doing anything. You know, I mean, if you're sitting on, you you got you got to come out of hiding. Well, all right, we have to come out of hiding and 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 be involved. And and one problem that we have 
is that decent people don't like to talk about sex in public. You know, I notice this all the time. You know, I'll bring something up and I can just see people. You know, I can just see him, and I just want to say, you know, you guys, I get it. I get that you don't want to talk about it. But every time we go like this, you know, and that is honestly what we want to do, right? Every time we do that, the enemy is advancing. You know, so we as the adults in the culture have to be aware of what's going on and deal with it, and we can't be prissy about it. All right. <coughs> um, hey. See, I'm a, I'm a public school teacher, oh. and I teach in an elementary level. Okay. And uh, this, all that you encapsulated tonight, I see the practical, real negative effects yeah. in the classroom every day. And the schools are, are getting overwhelmed with the mental health needs of these children that are suffering from all of what you talked about. I wonder if you could just comment on that. Well, you know, honestly, Jason, we started this evening with... Jason mentioning Love and Economics, the first book that I ever wrote. When I wrote that in 2001, that was exactly what was motivating me because I could see that instability in the family was making the kids crazy. You know, so we happen to see it in our particular case because we have a little boy. He's a grown man now, but we adopt a little boy from a Romanian orphanage. He was two and a half years old when we got him. Six months later, we gave birth to a baby girl. She grew in the normal way, you know. And the difference between those two and their development was staggering, right? And all that we had to do to make up for our son for what we were doing automatically and routinely and really taking for granted with our daughter, we would have taken it all for granted. I would have put her in daycare if I'd only had her. You know, I wouldn't have known. But, that, but then when I started to see, okay, this is a pattern. It happens with divorce. It happens with unmarried parenthood. It happens with multiple par partner fertility. The kids are coming unglued. They're coming into foster care more and more disturbed, right? And the school shootings are part of, of really a part of, of, of that whole mental health crisis. Honestly, there is not enough mental health treatment to ca take care of people who haven't been properly loved in their first 18 months of life, you know? Prevention is the only thing that can really deal with it. I, I, I firmly believe that. And you will never talk me out of that. I don't care what the Southern Poverty Law Center or anybody else says about it. I know I'm right about this. Kids need their parents, and that's what this is all about. Every, every point, for me, that's what it's all about. So I, I thank you for your testimony. My, my sister's a public school teacher, and she told me years ago that in the first week, she could pick out the kids who had two parents in the home and which ones didn't. It was so obvious in their behavior, you know, and you're confirming that. So thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you. So I just want to say thank you to everyone here for coming. I want to say thank you especially to the Siena Symposium board members whom I did not introduce, but that would be Elizabeth Kelly, Jeannie Buckeye, Ann Maloney, Kathy Devil, um, uh, Carol Bagley who left. Who, who else? Heidi. Heidi's here? Oh, Heidi, okay, yes, Heidi Giebel. Um, Teresa Collette who's not here, but so if you got one of our little postcards, the whole list of the board is on the back of it. And um, you'll see who, who's really helping with this effort. So I want to say thank you again for coming. On the way out, someone will be uh, handing you, if you wanted, a card in case you feel inclined to donate to our efforts. But I hope to see you again in August or, or next October. And if you want to sign up, if you're not on our mailing list, you can sign up outside or you can go to our website and there's an easy way to do it there. And then you'll find out about our events, okay? I don't send out many emails, but the ones I send out are packed. Okay, so God bless you all. Thank you so much for coming. Take care.